Okay, let's have a look at uh, engine malfunction analysis on the Boeing 777 aircraft. So, Boeing required the first pilot that sees a malfunction to call it immediately and clearly. In most non-normal cases, this means calling the ICAS message, potentially doing some prioritization, and then running the applicable checklist or memory items. However, engine malfunctions can lead to potentially one of three different checklists, not all of them enunciated. So, engine fail, which appears on ICAS, engine limit search tool, which does not, or engine severe damage separation, which does not. So some analysis is required to determine which checklist is the correct response to the failure. Previously, this would require the pilot monitoring to examine the engine indications, both internal and external, to determine which of the checklist condition statements were the most germane to the malfunction at hand. And that got pretty complex. So you've got N1, N2, N3, fuel flow, EGT, oil pressure, oil temperature, and uh, engine vibra vibration on the ICAS. Outside, you've got airframe vibration, asymmetric thrust, light and sound coming from the engine, all the things that can hit you when you've got a malfunctioning engine. And when you look at something as simple as EGT, is the EGT abnormally low? Is it abnormally high? Is it exceeding now or was it exceeding before, but now it's okay? It gets pretty complex. Now, if your airline runs this process, it probably scripts it fairly heavily and teaches the PM just to read out the important things and teaches them what's important, but it's still a pretty complex process to run correctly under pressure at 400 feet. So Boeing 2006, they sat down and revised all of the engine failure condition statements on the 777 and effectively encapsulated this paradigm that we're discussing now, which I'm calling identify the failure, but in the end, it comes down to two simple questions. So it's important that crew look at the failure indications at the time of the analysis, not during the time of the initial malfunction. For example, if the engine surges during takeoff, the crew may announce the malfunction, but they won't be running identify confirm commence until they get to 400 feet. At 400 feet, when the PF says identify the failure, if the engine is no longer surging, then there's no action required. The various engine malfunction checklist condition statements are used in principle to determine that an engine malfunction is in progress and which checklist is appropriate. Fire engine is driven by ICAS, it's the highest priority checklist, it comes with memory items and that's pretty straightforward. If you have fire engine left on ICAS, you're going to run fire engine left memory items to shut down, secure the engine and fire the bottles. Engine separation can be a little bit less clear but typically includes total thrust loss, missing engine instrumentations, other service related failures such as hydraulic and electrical problems, as well as the probable loss of the tack. You may not have airframe vibration. I think you will, but you may not. But in either case, an engine separation should be severe enough that you'll run engine severe damage separation memory items. After that, we've got engine stalling and surging. So ICAS indications uh, such as airframe vibration and asymmetric thrust. Uh, engine severe damage is primarily driven by airframe vibration with abnormal indications. And then we've got uh, engine fail which is an enunciated checklist. That's why it's in caps up here. It's the EECs detecting that the engine is below minimum model, turning off both fuel control valves um, and shutting down the engine. So outside of this process, or as, as part of it actually, engine malfunction identification comes down to two questions. So is the engine still running? So do we have engine fail on ICAS? And then also, is there airframe vibration? When you've got these two factors considered, the appropriate checklist can be selected. And so we have the flow chart. So while the flow chart is designed to illustrate the process, it's not something we drag out on a flight deck. You won't find it laminated in the dash. This is basically just giving you a pictorial representation of what we do. Remember that the indications used by the crew are those at the time of the analysis, not at the time of the previous failure. So let's have a bit of look at see how this works. So up here, the first thing is, do you have engine fail on ICAS? As discussed, that's saying, is the engine still running? But we're using it in reverse because that's the way ICAS works. Do you have engine fail? Yes, I do. Do you have airframe vibration? No, I don't. Okay, it's just an engine failure. So once the airplane's clean, con thrust is set on the other engine, flight path and nav is stabilized. Maybe you've thought about a mini plan. We're gonna run the engine failure checklist. Let's have another look. Up here we have, do you have engine fail on ICAS? Yes, we do. Do you have airframe vibration? Yes, we do. Well, if you've got an engine that has shut itself down and still has airframe vibration, you can consider that a damaged engine. And we're gonna run memory items on that. Again, we'll run those once flight path and nav is stabilized. We've thought about an engine out turn if that's required. We're going to shut the engine, not so much shut the engine down, but we're going to, because it should already be shut down, but we're going to secure it.
Okay, let's have a look at the other side of the tree. So let's say that we do not have engine fail in ICAS. So by implication, the engine is still running. Now the checklist asks us, do you have airframe vibration? And what you can see is that this question leads you to do one of two things. You'll either come down here, leave the engine running and reduce thrust on the engine. That's what limit surge stall memory items does. Or if there's airframe vibration, you'll come down here and run engine severe damage separation, which reduces the thrust to idle, shuts the fuel control off, pulls the engine fire switch and shuts the engine down. So you should be able to see that this is uh, a severity question. So basically you're choosing that whether this airframe vibration that you have, if you have air vibration, is it severe enough that you want to shut the engine down by memory or is it such that you're happy to leave it running? Don't forget that not anywhere in this flowchart have I mentioned calling the N1, the N2, the N3, looking at EGT exceedances, is there all pressure? None of that is the N2 frozen. None of that has come into this process. All of those indications led someone a while ago to say, we have an engine problem. And then after that, at some point for the pilot flying to say, oh, okay, identify the failure. And now we're here. So all of those engine indications, they lead into the flowchart. They're not part of the flowchart. And that's why it's so much simpler. So with the engine still running, no engine fail on ICAS. A simple consideration of airframe vibration, yes, no, would lead to severe damage separation checklist items for any airframe vibration at all, such as you might experience during a stall or surge type failure. As such, it should be clear that this airframe vibration question is actually a severity question in terms of the vibrations impact on the aircraft's ability to safely continue the takeoff. So the question is probably more appropriately, is the airframe vibration impacting flight safety of the aircraft, therefore the severe damage checklist memory items are required? How severe is the airframe vibration? Um, and as we've seen, a stalling and surging engine a takeoff thrust will almost certainly result in airframe vibration well in excess of the simulator's ability to replicate. In this scenario, which checklist do you think Boeing would believe is the appropriate response? Probably it's engine limit surge to all memory items. So it's not just a simple yes, no. There's an element of severity and probably the underlying context is what do you want to do with that engine? Do you want to keep it running at idle, reduce thrust to keep it running, or, or do you want to shut it down? Having reduced the thrust to idle and completed the memory items, uh, but the engine continues to surge and stall and carry on, what do you do now? What do you think Boeing are expecting you to do? So typically it's not unusual under training to decide, decide to revert to either a severe damage separation memory item to shut the engine down or to action the next sequence in the uh, engine limit surge stall checklist fuel control switch to cut off by memory to shut the engine down when it's stalling and surging at idle. But typically a stalling and a stalling surging engine at idle thrust is not a threat to the aircraft. It's distracting, it's annoying, it's even bad for PR, but it's not an impact on flight safety. The stalling stall surge limit checklist memory items leave the engine running at idle, even if it's still stalling and surging, until the airplane is cleaned up and the non-normal checklist is run. Broadly speaking, if the failure wasn't bad enough at take or thrust to cause you to go straight to severe damage separation, then the impact on the ability to fly the aircraft safely when it's stalling and surging at idle should be negligible. The checklist will secure the engine once the airplane is clean at a safe altitude, and that's in keeping with Boeing's non-normal checklist philosophy. That said, crew always retain the right to implement severe damage separation memory items to secure the engine if you think this is the safest course of action. Okay, so let's try this out with some actual scenarios. So just after V1, there's a loud bang, swing of asymmetric thrust and airframe vibration. At 400 feet, the pilot flying calls identify the failure. By this time, the vibration has disappeared. ICAS indicates engine fail and N2 shows deceased engine. Let's run the flowchart. What do you get? So as a reminder, here's our flowchart. I'll give you a moment to work out where you're going to end up. And now let's step our way through it. So do you have engine fail? Well, yeah, we do. Do you have airframe vibration? No, we don't. So we're going to run the engine fail checklist and that won't be happening until we're clean, comp thrust is set, flight path nav sorted out, maybe we've actioned a mini plan. 
But the outcome of this is engine fail checklist, no requirement to run memory items at low altitude. Once again, even in this scenario, the crew always retain the right to shut the engine, secure the engine, shut the engine down and secure it if that's deemed to be the required safest outcome. Let's have a look at another one. So let's have a look at the second scenario. So just after rotation, the left engine surges, generates an EGT exceedance. At 400 feet, the pilot flying calls identify the failure. The PM reviews the ICAS and there's no engine fail. But the EGT continues to exceed. And there's some mild airframe buffered from the surging. Run the flowchart. What do you get? Here's your flowchart. Give you a second or so to work your way through. And let's have a go ourselves. Do we have engine fail and ICAS? Well, no, we don't. Do we have airframe vibration? Let's just say that uh, I'm deciding that it's minimal and I'm happy to operate on reduced thrust, so I'm going to say no airframe vibration as such, remembering that I can change my main later on. In which case, I'm now down here in limit surge stall memory items. I'm going to reduce the thrust back on that engine until I feel it's under control or indications are within limits, etc. Um, and I'll be doing that once flight path and nav is stabilised and any engine out procedure is the immediate actions are dealt with. So again, airframe vibration is a severity question. For engine stalling and surging, even with some airframe vibration, the answer should probably be no. Uh, let's do another one. Okay, on this one, nearing V1, a rumbling develops and at VR, the engine basically disintegrates with exceedances and continuing unusual airframe vibration. At 400 feet, the pilot flying says, identify the failure. ICAS shows engine fail. There's strong continued airframe vibration. Run the flow chart. What do you get? I probably don't have to give you too much lo too long with this one because we're going to go engine fail and ICAS. Sure was. Do you have airframe vibration? I sure do. Okay, we're going to run memory items from the engine severe damage separation checklist. It's worth noting that that engine severe damage separation checklist also directs changes in airspeed and altitude in an attempt to reduce ongoing unusual severe airframe vibration. Remember at this point when you're deciding whether to run memory items, that engine is shut down. So by pulling the fire handle, turning the fuel control off and the other actions you're taking, you're not actually shutting that engine down. That's already been done. You are cutting off hydraulic flow, but in terms of fuel, you're not making any real change. But when you get to the checklist, the checklist is going to attempt to try and ameliorate those airframe vibrations that you've that you experienced during the failure and then continued afterwards. Let's have a look at another one. Okay, let's look at one more. This one's a little tricky. So after takeoff, the FMC calls for a thrust reduction to climb two. But while the left thrust lever retards, the left F1 N1 does not. This is picked up, an engine malfunction is identified, so once flight path and nav is sorted, the pilot flying calls identify the failure. So the PM looks at the ICAS and there's no engine fail. There's no airframe vibration either, but there's clearly an engine problem, but he doesn't really have anything to deal with. But let's run the flow chart and see where we get. Here's the flow chart. I'll let you run through and let's follow you through. So do we have engine fail and ICAS? No, we don't. Do we have airframe vibration? No, we don't. Okay, well, we'll end up with engine limit surge stall. Interestingly enough, um, one of the condition statements of engine limit surge stall is no response to thrust lead movement or the response is abnormal. So in the traditional way of running unannunciated checklists, if the pilot flying could identify that there is no response to thrust lever movement, a direct result of that identified condition would be just to simply call for engine limit surge door left memory items because the left engine is not responding to thrust lever movement or the response is abnormal. But what you can see is that this flow chart took us to the correct place anyway. Either of those responses would be appropriate in the circumstances that have occurred. So in conclusion, let me just say that the flowchart and the procedures and techniques described here are not intended to replace common sense and airmanship on the part of the crew. Nothing contained here contradicts anything in the QRH or the FCTM or your FCOM, or your Boeing FCOM. Um, and in fact, if you have a look at the uh, engine malfunction analysis article on Affinitim, you'll see that actually the, the procedures and techniques described here are actually pretty much justified by those documents. That said, there will always be engine malfunctions in the real world which fall outside the scope of our simulator's ability to rep replicate and provide a, a training environment for crew. So. 
nothing should be seen to diminish the authority of the captain to exercise judgment in altering procedures as required to assure a safe outcome when dealing with any situation. But for what I've talked about here, just remember use the indications at the time of the analysis, use your checklist and ICAS priority, and remember your two questions. Is the engine still running? Or is there engine fail in ICAS? And is there airframe vibration? Let's just finish off with a short video. There have been numerous occasions where a high power compressor